Thank you. Thank you. So I'm happy to take some questions, hear about stuff folks are working on. Stunned into silence. <laughs> Someone's got to break the ice. Can you speak specifically to the limits of uh, civilian over oversight boards? Okay, yeah, good. So I was in Rochester, New York last week where there's a major campaign underway to create a, you know, a police review board that will have more teeth than the old system. And that a lot of campaigns like this underway that imagine that if we could just have more accountability of police that this would solve our problem. And the problem with past efforts is, well, they just didn't have quite enough teeth. Well, the reality is, is that we've been trying police review boards for 50 years and have nothing to show for it. No, not only are no police really being disciplined, and there's some truth to that, not totally, but there's no evidence that when they are disciplined, it has any effect on day-to-day -day policing. See, it's, it rests on this deterrence model that says that if we just punish enough police, the police will change their behavior for fear of punishment. Well, that's, of course, exactly the mindset that drives the whole criminal justice system. It's a gigantic revenge factory. So I reject it on that basis, but also it's all based on these proceduralist reforms. It assumes that if the police just follow the rules and conduct the war on drugs according to the rules, that everything will be okay. The problem is the rules are unjust fundamentally unjust. The rules, when properly followed, reproduce class and race inequality in the United States. I don't want the police to follow the rules more closely. I want to get them out of our business as much as we possibly can. And these review boards don't do anything to raise those questions. They merely, a lot of this stuff about holding cops accountable is driven by a fairly small number of horrific high profile incidents, you know, the shootings caught on camera and stuff. And then there's an attempt to kind of reverse engineer, how could we have prevented this? Well, if we'd given them a little better training, oh, if we just held them accountable, gotten them fired or prosecuted, then that particular incident maybe won't happen again. But this assumes that the problem of policing is just these isolated high-profile incidents. But it's not. It's 10 million total bullshit arrests every year. 10 million. Almost 2 million of them low-level drug arrests. And that's a problem of over-policing that is not going to be fixed by our civilian review board because the vast majority of those arrests are totally lawful and follow the rules exactly as described. And so no review board is going to provide any relief for people who are burdened with constant stop and frisks, constant arrests on bullshit charges. It's just not going to help at all. Yeah? Um, would you say in your recent studies also that in recent years, the, the racism between Latinos and Latinos, black and black, uh, like black officer or black suspects, Latino officer or Latino suspect is rising. That racism that you're, that you're speaking about that's built in the mission. Okay, so one of the responses we've seen to, to abusive, problematic policing is the idea, well, if we could just get the police to look more like the community, that this will somehow fix the problem. This is the police diversity strategy, hire a few more black and brown police officers, get police to live where they work. Every study ever done shows that this makes no positive difference. The race of the officers is irrelevant. Uh, residency requirements are irrelevant. They're great for economic development, 
getting some folks in the neighborhood some good paying jobs is good for the neighborhood except of course as soon as they get the job they move out of the neighborhood and then they identify with the police and they move into a police neighborhood out in the suburbs and they, they're not really part of the community anymore for the most part but basically as long as their mission is to wage war on the public about everything in our everyday life it's not going to matter what race they are in fact some studies show that non-white officers are more likely to make arrests of non-white people than white officers are in similar circumstances does not help yeah how dangerous is a Camilla Harris presidency? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, dangerous. <laughs> yeah, dangerous. I, I mean, it's not going to help. Her attempts to rebrand herself as, you know, thinking about the well-being of communities. I think we know what she's really about. She's got a long record as a prosecutor, and it's pretty horrible. You know, putting uh, mothers in jail when their kids don't show up at school, you know. Cr basically, a massive campaign of criminalizing poverty, especially of black and brown people. She is a legal proceduralist who believes that the police and the rule of law are going to be what makes these communities better. If we just threaten enough people and punish enough people, that'll solve the problem. And that's exactly the opposite of what we really need. And, and Cory Booker's not much better on this, despite the First Step Act and some good stuff about marijuana. Uh, I don't, when push comes to shove, you know, he's going to back a police-led solution, I think. Can you talk about police unions and how they, like, thwart those city oversight boards and how, yeah, how they water yeah. the legislation that's them? Uh, let me just add that, that, you know, none of the Democratic candidates have great, great positions on this. I mean, Sanders voted for the 94 crime bill along with Joe Biden. Now, he says he did it to support the Violence Against Women Act, but there are a lot of problems with that act. It, handled, it handed domestic violence issues over to the police to manage, and funded services but only to very big organizations that were involved in a lot of kind of personal responsibility mindset stuff and really disempowered a lot of community-based groups that were trying to deal with domestic violence as a community empowerment issue so yeah a lot of problems to go around so just one more time police unions unions okay sorry uh, so there, there's a little bit of, uh, I think, uh, overstating of police power through their unions to some extent. Uh, and I, particularly problematic are the, the, is the idea, well, the reason we have mass incarceration is because of private prisons and prison guard unions. No, that's, that's not the case. It's so much more deeply embedded into our political system and the interests involved are so much bigger than that. The whole austerity politics relies on this, which is about trillions of dollars, not a few hundred million here or there. So, but police unions are important and they're important for local struggles because they're the repository, they're the center of authoritarian politics in these local places. And so their power comes not just because they can give a few dollars to this politician or that politician or because they rhetorically are against something, but because they represent all these authoritarian interests, which include usually big business and real estate developers and all of that. But they're out front, they're the most visible, and they do things often in a very ham-fisted way. So I think we have to go out after them very directly. Not because they're unions, not because they want to get 2% on their pension or whatever. I mean, workers are going to form unions. I'm a union member and a fourth generation, you know. So I'm, I'm not about breaking the unions. I'm about attacking their politics. So there are a few things that are being done about this. One is that some groups are organizing to block their contracts. So in Austin about two years ago, they organized to get the city council to vote against the contract that had been agreed to by the mayor. 
that gave them a lot of sweetheart deals and perks and you know avoiding prosecution and stuff discipline and stuff like that there's a similar campaign underway in San Francisco and other cities are looking into it also uh, there's an effort underway to figure out which politicians are taking this cop union money in California they already have a statewide database that's been created so that you can see who the different police and correction unions are giving money to. And I'm in talks with some of those folks about trying to do this on a national scale. And there's some, I'm trying to maybe get some interns, I'm talking to some other academics to see what we could do over this summer. Because anybody who's taking that police union money is not our friend. Because that money stands for everything that we are against. It stands for the idea that police are the solution to every problem. And once you go down that road, that means there's never going to be enough money for the things that will actually make communities safer and stronger. So find out who's taking the money and call them out on it. Make the politics clear. This is not just support the troops. This is criminalize the communities. That's what taking that money means. Yeah. What made you uh, recognize there was a problem? At what point of your life did you start getting involved uh, as as a white man, uh, recognizing that there is racial injustices in the crime yeah. systems? Well, I didn't grow up in an all-white community, and I've lived in a lot of different kinds of places, and uh, and I came from a labor household. And, you know, the problems of, uh, in chapter, chapter two of the book is a history of policing, the origin and nature of policing, and, you know, police, uh, policing has not, uh, we often hear in activist spaces, well, community, uh, police are just an extension of slave patrols. Well, that's one part of the story. I talk about uh, Savannah, Georgia, uh, not, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Savannah, some other places where, yes, police forces grew out of attempts to manage slave populations in these industrial emerging cities where slaves actually worked outside the home, traveled to work, and had to be. But that doesn't explain policing in the North. Policing in the North was a system of labor management. And it certainly doesn't explain policing that emerges in England. There are no non-white people in England in 1820. You know, it's about managing the white working class that's flooding into the cities to staff the new factories, bringing with them rural attitudes, radical ideas, but also they don't want to be treated like animals in these factories. And they resist through both working class pleasures and the formation of unions and strikes and, and monkey wrenching and all this stuff. And policing is created to manage that problem. And that was true across the American North as well. And my family were all coal miners. So they experienced policing in the context of labor struggle. So I grew up uh, you know, during the civil rights era in a neighborhood that was half white, half black, in a family that had experienced policing from the perspective of labor unions, so I always had a skepticism about policing. Yes? What made you want to get into this type of work? Well, it was not my first idea. So I, when I was an undergrad, I studied uh, urban studies and community development stuff. And I went to work uh, after school for the San Francisco Coalition on Homelessness to do housing and economic development and community development work. But this was the late 80s and early 90s, and all the homeless and formerly homeless folks we were working with were getting criminalized. This turned out to be the beginning of broken windows policing. And we got my boss was like, can you look into this, figure out what's going on? And so I got kind of pulled into working with the ACLU and outreach workers and learning about the real nature of policing in relationship to the poor, basically. And then I was like, I'm going to go back to school. 
So in 93, I moved to New York to go back to school right, right as Rudolph Giuliani is elected. And the same thing started happening in New York. So I got pulled into that same work again. And, you know, turns out I knew a lot more about the broken windows theory and the criminalization of poverty than most other graduate students and had a kind of comparative advantage. And there were a lot more jobs for criminologists than there were for urban community development scholars. And so, you know, I renamed myself as a police scholar, basically, a critical police scholar. A long answer to the question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm actually a town planner, community uh -huh. <laughs> but um, I was wondering in a real broad um, policy idea, do you think it's better to give less money to the police or is it better to start giving more money to the you know counselors and, and right and there's a chicken and egg yeah. problem. Well, so I think we can start doing both simultaneously, and we just have to be, but it's a question of local struggle and strategy, you know, so uh, I think that we could get rid of all school police right away, that we, that's what we should be calling for, and we could immediately ramp up alternatives, and there's no reason to think these school police are helping. I mean, we could get the police out of the sex work business, close down these vice units overnight. They don't do anything positive. <laughs> we should be looking at decriminalizing sex work, legalizing drugs, these kinds of things. So some things are about just policing, <coughs> but other things require that we also invest in alternatives because sometimes, uh, well, because communities have real problems. Not sometimes, they, communities have real problems that need to be addressed. The problem is we're trying to use the police to address them. So we gotta build up the alternatives. And so the book has eight chapters about specific things police do that are a bad idea and what we can be doing instead. Yes, very concrete, hundreds of end notes with examples and copies of reports, this is what we could be doing instead to make this place better. Yeah? Um, what do you think are some strategies to overcome the challenges that gentrification introduces to like anti-austerity um, organizing, anti-police organizing? Even gentrifiers you know, want to live in safe communities I mean, I, my view on gentrification is a little unusual. I think the problem, of the way to fix gentrification is to reinvigorate the labor movement and to demand more hiring at the, uh, in local government. It's about anti-austerity because gentrification is about a wage mismatch, which is that basically folks in the neighborhood who are living there a long time their wages are not going up, or their wages are going down. Folks with high education who are in the formal economy, their wages are going way up. So they're competing for housing with one another. There's no more housing in the, in the super nice areas, so they're getting pushed out. How do communities resist that? They've got to demand higher wages so that they can hold on to these places and compete. That's the real solution. Other kinds of like, how do we keep the outsiders out? It's not going to work for one thing. They're, these market forces are extremely powerful. City government totally supports it. So I think we've got to build these communities, which means in demanding better jobs, more pay, more resources for these communities. That, that I think is, and I think if you couch it right, you can find liberals within the gentrifiers who will support you. Because they want this community to be nicer too for them and their kids. They don't, you know, nobody wants a homeless, mentally ill person running around throwing stuff at people. That's not good for anybody. Nobody wants gunfights on the corner. That's not good for anybody. 
So there's some room for common cause there. We just got to get those people, the gentrifiers, to not see the police as the only solution. Because right now, that's the solution to every problem for them is call 911 and get the police involved. So we've got to develop campaigns that say, no, there's an alternative. There's a better way to deal with this. You don't have to be permit patty, you know, about every goddamn little thing. <laughs> uh, yeah? Uh, well, in relation to uh, getting liberals and, and folks like that to sort of see our, our side of things, um, I run a aid organization down in London, and we do a lot of outreach to people on you know, different sides of the political spectrum, and saying, like, hey, have you considered this? Um, and some folks have said that's either a waste of time or not productive or just not even worth doing. Um, how do you feel about that sort of So thing? what is it you're trying to convince them about? You know, different views of policing, you know, different views of our entire society, how we organize okay, possible so, alternatives. Okay, so here's the Maybe thing. I think we have to shift our focus around this question of policing. Mm -hmm. I don't think we fix police by going to the police commission meeting and yelling at the police commissioner about police accountability and mm -hmm. training. <coughs> I, d I think what we do is we go over their head. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways my book is a book not about police accountability, it's a book about political accountability about resting the blame with the folks who really have the power. And there's an advantage to this in terms of organizing, which is it allows us to have a positive message rather than a negative message, an aspirational message, right? Which is not get rid of killer cops. The message is build stronger communities, house folks, get them decent medical care, create real pathways to employment. These are the solutions. And it's harder for the reactionaries and the authoritarians to go all ape shit about that as being anti-cop. It's like, yes, cops cause harms, and we don't think we should be using them on all this stuff, but our real focus is, why can't we have these things that we know will help our community? That, so that's... I'm trying to get people to shift the organizing focus away from the police commission and to the local city council member who won't stand up for what the community really needs because he's in bed with the real estate developers and the police union and has given up. Yeah? Do you think all about police response to like protest movements? Okay, uh, something more specific, or just how police have been used to suppress, or like yeah, yeah. So that's chapter that's chapter ten of the book uh, is political policing. So political policing has always been at the core of policing because policing is a political project. Policing is created when the state can't manage political threats through means it had been using before, like the military or informal. They needed a new institutional mechanism for coercion. And so political policing is always there at the core of policing, but at times when real threats to the political status quo are low, political policing is less apparent. It's in the shadows, it has a nice face, it walks out and talks to you and facilitates your march, but when things get hot, and then political policing mushrooms, and you start having intelligence files and infiltrators, and police won't give you the permit anymore, and if you step outside the box, they're going to do mass arrests and push you around and pepper spray you. So that's what we saw with Occupy Wall Street. Initially, okay, have your protests, we don't like it, but once they started really gaining some momentum, holding disruptive protests, refusing, then they started surveilling them, sending in infiltrators to do collection, and mass arrests and violence towards them. So political policing, even when things seem cool, it's always there under the surface and all these departments have intelligence divisions. What does the intelligence division do? 
you know, they keep some records on gangs and organized crime, but there's always a file drawer full with protest groups and what they're up to, and yeah. So, uh, to your point about political policing, have you come up with any uh, strategies that you found super effective as to um, showing people the reality of, of political policing and the political end of uh, police departments? You know, in uh, New London, we have uh, a local legend that uh, the first of the Palmer raids were actually perpetrated uh, okay. by the, by the uh, New London Police Department. And we tell that to most folks, among other things, and they say, oh, well, that's interesting. But you know, being that it's a century. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to take something out of context. So, um, read chapter 10, because I talk about the Palmer Raids and all that history, but I try to also bring it up to today. Mm -hmm. And we, we, you know, we have to make things concrete to people, to make things concrete to what they're experiencing today. We can't just tell them, we need to talk about history, but we got to connect it with what's happening today. So we got to, always be able to make clear the harms that the political policing is causing today. So we've got to have a framework about some kind of idea of, of human rights or justice or democracy. I mean, we don't want to overplay certain kinds of liberal myths about how great democracy is as practice, etc. But people can relate to the idea that uh, police should not be a political arm of the state, even though they always are. Mm -hmm. So we can. So there's a legitimacy problem for them, but we have to make it real to people. And it's hard because they try to stay in the shadows with this stuff as much as they can. Mm -hmm. Mike, can I jump in on that question? Yeah. Um, and so I mean to kind of connect back with Occupy Oakland. One of the things that was successful about that movement was amongst the people themselves. A lot of times we talk about what we do about the police, at least there, why that space was what it was, was people kind of amongst ourselves kind of made a decision that we weren't going to negotiate or listen to or abide by what the police wanted people to do. And so in terms of, there's a lot of people in this room locally involved in a lot of different struggles. And I think part of these questions about like how do we kind of play better for the future and some of these things in terms of kind of having that kind of collective, not being able to be divided. So the police are often successful when they can identify the good protesters. Mm -hmm. And so to kind of amongst ourselves figure out a way so that we can create a situation where there are no good protesters, uh, where at least no pro protesters kind of take that role, if you will, um, if you kind of follow what I'm saying. Yeah. And Occupy Wall Street was pretty good about that, not requesting permits and stuff. So. I think it's important, yeah, to show the contradictions, if you will, uh, by asserting your rights rather than abiding by what the police just try to tell you you can do, which is often not lawful. And um, what was I going to say about that? Yeah, so the police want to use this negotiated management style of getting everyone to cooperate with them while they put you in some pen three blocks from where you want to be, and then they're like, that was a successful protest. And so groups that uh, call me, as they often do, about advice about protest permits and stuff, I'm like, do you have to have a stage and amplified sound? No, we just want to pick it. Do not call the police. Do not tell them you're coming because they will negotiate you out of everything you're trying to do. Just go and do it. And then they'll show up and they'll be kind of angry at you, but it's going to take them 20 minutes to organize themselves to push you out of there. So at least you can have 20 minutes, and then everyone in your group is going to be like, why can't we have a peaceful picket in front of the business that we're angry at why is it that the police always force us to move two blocks away and stand in a metal pen? So you're educating people about the nature of political policing when you do that. You just have to, you know, do things smart and safely, right? Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that at, um, I think it's called Resist Marxism, uh, or like a white supremacy, um, demonstration here in Providence. Uh, there were a couple of them, and there were a lot of protesters. Um, 
but what I've been told is that the police seem to be on the side of the white supremacists. Have you been seeing that in the country? Or Yes, do you want to add to that? I think the clarification is that it was riot cops back behind the, yeah. the neo-Nazis who had just started a bunch of different kind of stations, but not instead dividing a line. Yeah but acting as sort of a second guard. Yeah, well this is always the case, right, that uh, sometimes it's more obvious than others, but the history of political policing is never politically neutral. It's always favors, you know, authoritarian groups over the alternatives. So the, the infiltrators, the intelligence gathering, the street suppression is always directed at, at left-oriented groups, for sure. Now they will they feel the need to try to produce a sense of democratic legitimacy so that they will always deny these preferences. Mm -hmm. But when we allow police to make decisions about who gets a permit, when and where, how things are policed, you will see in every case that the right wing has certain kinds of advantages in those arrangements. Yeah. Um, That's good. For one, we have you know, time check, uh, it's 7 o'clock right now. Um, we have this space until 7.45. They close around 8, so that's just a point of information. We don't have to keep on doing the Q&A type of thing. We can shift over into conversation um, if people feel that that's uh, valuable um, to create a space for, you know, discussing the current uh, campaigns that are occurring, reflections on movements that we've been involved in, etc. cetera. Um, I do have one question, if that's okay with you. Uh, speaking about that, uh, what happens when in our campaigns we avoid directly challenging uh, police power? Um, either that or what happens when the things that we're aiming to achieve uh, in that pursuit we avoid challenging the police? Yeah. So this is often the, this is often the, the challenge that we face when our friends and allies adopt proceduralist strategies. So this is, it's very tricky about how to figure out what's a reform that just re-empowers the system, re-legitimates it versus one that's leading towards a logic of the alternative. So the, the folks in Rochester have built a pretty amazing coalition across race and class lines to demand this police accountability board. So my job is not to go in there and tear that all down and say, oh, you're, you made a stupid strategic error or whatever, because they're building community power. They're building a real coalition there. But it, it is my job to point out the risks, which is that if that becomes the end of the conversation, you're not going to get what you want. It has to be the beginning of the conversation. So what I often say to folks is that, you know, it's great that you're doing this, that you've, you're trying to win this, but what's the next step? And how can that next step really get to what the community really wants, ultimately? Which is not just better training for the police, but better communities where the police don't have to be so involved. So the risk of ending the conversation with just the procedural reforms is that political leaders will go on stage and say, we worked out this great compromise with the community, and now everything is great. And we can just get right back to doing what we were doing before. Maybe we'll try to shoot a few fewer number of black people in the future, but otherwise everything is good now. And this is like the thing with implicit bias training. You know, liberal politicians love this because it's a way of saying, we're doing something about the race problem where no one's at fault, no one's going to be held accountable, and nothing is going to change. Except that they spent $30 million on a giant, wasted, implicit bias training review. Yeah, so we don't want... We don't want to end the conversation with reforms that are really designed to restore legitimacy to policing because policing is the problem. That's the problem. Even when it's done effectively, it's a problem. 
Was well, someone in the back? Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, um, uh, did you hear about uh, the militia man at the front? At the border? At the border, yeah. Yeah. So is that considered domestic? That's chapter 9. Are, those, are, those, are, those, are, those, are they considered domestic terrorists? Well, what does that mean to say domestic terrorist and who decides okay. what a terrorist is? So uh, after the book came out, you know, there was that horrible shooting massacre in Las Vegas. And I wrote an essay that said that our goal should not be to get that labeled as terrorism. I understand the desire to do this because we see only people of color getting labeled terrorists. We don't see the white groups being labeled terrorists. So, but to me, this is like giving anti-bias training to narcotics units. It's thinking that racial disparity is the problem. But the problem is not racial disparity, it's calling things terrorism. That's the problem. Because even calling what other folks are doing, some of which is horrific, when we label it terrorism in the U.S., what we're doing is we're enabling a massive system of illegitimate and unjust policing. That's modus operandi is entrapment, surveillance, breaking into people's privacy to resolve what are political problems at the heart of the American political project. And we've got to demand that we actually address the political problems. Like, what the hell are we doing in the Middle East? But see, once we label it terrorism, then it's just the evildoers. All discussion of politics, shared responsibility for this mess, all that goes right out the window, and we just ramp up the power of the FBI to go around spying on people and entrapping them. So, do I want something to be done about right-wing extremist movements? Yes, but it's a political problem at the heart of American politics. We've got to get rid of Trump and the whole Trump infrastructure that is enabling and supporting right-wing extremism, and we've got to root it out at the local, you know, we've got to see it as a political project instead of imagining that the criminal justice system is going to save us from that. Because it's not. It's in bed with those people. Can you speak to the characteristics of substance and justice? So, proceduralist justice, again, is this idea, get the police to professionally follow the law. Substantive justice is the idea of actually looking at what kinds of outcomes these systems produce. So again, if, if we think the problem of the drug war is just that it's racially disparate, then the way we fix that is to arrest more white people on drug charges. But if we think that there's a substantive problem with the drug war, then the solution is to end it, to replace it with an actual public health oriented approach, an economic development oriented approach to the drug problem. Because even procedurally proper drug arrests are substantially unjust. And this is really the core of the problem of most academic research about policing, is that it has completely lost sight of substantive justice issues. It is entirely focused on questions of effectiveness and professionalism in carrying out a mission that is unjust. To bring those ethical considerations back in, what are we accomplishing by turning this over to the criminal justice system? Local strategic questions people are sorting with, are, are struggling with, I mean, trying to sort out. Well, if not, there are chips and soda in the back. I'm going <laughs> to stick around. I have some copies of the book that uh, I can sell for cheap and sign. So uh, thanks for, for the great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.